chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. And we began to consider this in our last study. We considered the three pillars in the verse. The three pillars for the apostolic life and ministry and work which Paul now passes on to Timothy. Not that Timothy is an apostle, but Paul will pass to him his policy and approach to life. And here it is, the three pillars, the doctrine, the manner of life, which is really another way in the Greek of saying self-training, disciplined life, and purpose or policy is an equally good way of translating it. It means that which is exhibited, my strategy, my policy for ministry and life. And we considered that last study, that we must all be advancing in the knowledge of doctrine, all have a clear view of our manner of life, and the disciplined life for the Lord, and our policy, what uh, we aim to do for the Lord and how we aim to live. And then flowing out of those three is the list faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Well, these are the graces that honor those three fundamental pillars of the life of the servant of God. And we're going to focus on one, God willing, in the time available to us now, and that is faith. Faith, what the Apostle Peter calls Precious faith, the first of the graces mentioned here. Precious faith. I hope you don't mind my inserting the Apostle Peter's term, well, at least in the King James translation. Valuable, worthy, precious faith given to us at regeneration, at conversion, when we came to Christ. For by grace are you saved, says the Apostle Paul, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it is the gift of God, faith given to us. Well, at conversion, here we are, far from God, and then we hear the gospel, or we read it, or somebody witnesses it to us. And we are convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit, convicted of sin. And we're convinced of our spiritual need. Those twin things, convicted, convinced, convicted of sin, convinced of our need of God and of life and of heaven. And so, by the blessing of the Spirit of God, we are given faith to believe and we believe the gospel with all our hearts. And we come to Christ and we apply to him for salvation, for forgiveness. We repent of our sin. That is faith operating, appropriating the grace of God. It is part of our regeneration and our conversion. And we're assured and we're certain we're saved. Have you come to Christ with the God-given faith to repent of sin, to embrace what Christ has done for you in suffering and dying on Calvary's cross. Well, yet, then there is ongoing faith. And here in verse 10, faith, thou hast fully known, says Paul, my faith, my continuing practice of faith. And he urges Timothy to always be practicing faith. That's what we have to do. Exercise faith every hour, every day. Faith is to be exercised. Precious, precious faith, the gift of God, and it will grow as it is employed, as it is used. If it's left to one side, then it begins to fade. So it has to be exercised and deepened. And by it comes assurance and by it comes communion with God. By it comes strength for sanctification. By it comes instrumentality. 
precious faith given by God to be exercised constantly to secure all these blessings. Now the trouble is that though we're saved, we are still to such a large extent in this life of the earth earthy. We are earthy creatures and we recoil from faith. We love it. We value it. It is precious faith. And yet, the old nature doesn't like it. It doesn't want faith. You remember the children of Israel? Who doesn't? When they were led out of Egypt, and then there is Moses, he goes up Mount Sinai to receive the great revelation, the commandments of God, and the people managed to prevail upon Aaron, the brother of Moses, the high priest, to make them a golden calf. They were not satisfied with faith. They wanted a God they could see. They wanted a God they could touch that was physical. And that's the history of images and idol worship and everything else, something that can be seen because we recoil from faith. And it's the same today. I don't really want to get into this, but even among Bible believers, not content with faith and its power and its wonders and its fruits, which connects us with God. People want to miracles. People want phenomena. People want things, tongues, and things, even if they're not like the ones in Bible times, which were special authentications given by God for times of revelation and the authentication of apostles and Christ himself in the case of miracles and such things, but phony ones and invented ones and conjured ones and manipulated ones because something they can see. And I remember saying to an ardent, charismatic person some years ago, you know, or trying to remonstrate that these things were not for, to, for today. And he said to me, yes, but if we didn't have these, how could I have faith? Ah, they were a substitute for faith. Show me something that I can see. I've always been. There's something in the fallen side of us that recoils from faith. And we have to see that. And so it is in daily life. You have hard circumstances. They may be very difficult and very trying. And our natural tendency is to want to complain or think this is unreasonable or this should never, ever have happened. It should not be for a Christian person that I have this experience. Where's my faith? We'll talk about this. Faith in the providence of God and his nearness and the fact that he knows and the fact that he's allowed it. Faith is not being exercised. And uh, we all suffer from recoiling from faith. And we say, give us sight. But we walk by faith, not by sight. That's the scripture. And the just shall live by faith. And that means not only be justified by faith, be saved by the exercise of faith at the very beginning of the Christian life, faith in Christ. But it means we live the rest of our lives by faith, by faith in God. And then he reveals himself to us. Faith is vital to prayer. I'll give you some headings in just a moment. The Apostle James says concerning prayer, let him ask in faith. You have to have faith when you pray. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Not doubting for a moment that God can answer prayer. Not that he will answer it particularly the way we ask. In his great wisdom, he may answer our need by a way unexpected to us. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. He's a double-minded man. I have faith. I believe God can help me in my problem. But I want also this and that from the world. I'm a double-aimed person. 
and I waver and I don't put my trust wholly in God. I'm going to talk first of all about faith in God's providence. Faith must be in the providential care of God over his children. He ordains everything that happens to us. Now, of course, he does not ordain our sin and our failing, our waywardness and our wanderings, but he may allow them. So in a sense, he has ordained them. I did it. I sinned. I was headstrong. I was foolish. I set out to go the wrong direction or do the wrong thing or have the wrong priority and exercise it. And God, in his great wisdom, said he or she will go down that path so far and discover the error of his ways and the pain that it brings and the foolishness of it. And then I will restore him and bring him back. So even the things that I've done, God has allowed. Why God is so gracious that if you or I are about to do some very foolish and even wicked thing, and it will lead to something much deeper and much more serious than we could possibly handle, then God may even prevent us doing that and stop it by some circumstantial means. But nevertheless, everything that happens to us is either by his direct arrangement or his allowing. He is the superintendent of our lives, his providential care. And so when we have difficulties, personal difficulties, hardships and so on, we don't complain or shouldn't do. We should be, yes, try to do things some other way, pray for help by all means, try to improve our situation, but never think we're abandoned. God has allowed it. He ordains everything. He permits everything for me. I'm a child of God. He sees. He has a purpose. There is a purpose behind every step of the way. He hears my prayers. He knows my limits. He is filled with compassion and kindness. We speak about the doctrine of Christian contentment. The Puritans used to make much of Christian contentment. It's belief in the providential care of God and trust in him. That great Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs gave in his book the rare jewel of Christian contentment. He gave the crowning definition of Christian contentment and everybody ever since has used it. It's so beautiful. It's a sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal of every circumstance and every situation. Let's practice putting our faith in God's providential care over us and trust him, trust him, pray to him. Yes, there's much for us to do in life to uh, improve circumstances and our situation, care for our family, work out our careers and so on. So always seek the blessing of God and the guidance of God. But when th things take unexpected directions and there are problems or causes of grief and losses, remember always we're to trust him because he knows and he ordains and he overrules. Yea, says David, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That's the spirit of the believer in God. And those beautiful words of Anna Waring, the Irish poet of the 19th century, who took the first two verses of Psalm 23. And she didn't paraphrase them, but she wrote her reflection on them. Wherever he may guide me, no want shall turn me back. My shepherd is beside me, and nothing can I lack. His wisdom ever waketh, his sight is never dim. He knows the way he taketh, and I will walk 
with him. That's the spirit of the Christian, to trust in the providence and the providential care of our God and of Christ Jesus, our Savior. So that's the first test for faith. Are we trusting in his providential care? Is it the whole way in which we approach life and our attitude to it? Love him who holds in his hands the reins of your life. Love him and trust him and bring everything before him in prayer. Call upon him. So that's the first department of faith, to trust the providence of God for the believer, that is. Have faith in his help, precious faith. Have faith in his help. Apply it when you need help. But here's an important thing. Put your faith in help, the help and the power of God for all the things for which you need his help. In other words, don't say to yourself, I need help in this area of my life, the acquisition of a home and a family, and I don't pray for help in other important areas of my life. Well, that isn't the proper operation of faith. I exercise faith for the help of God, first of all, in sanctification. Every day, Lord, help me. Help me to be a better person. Help me to overcome my tendency to do this. Praying about my besetting sin, my current worst weakness, what is your great weakness at the moment? What is it that goes wrong? Well, feature it in your opening prayer every day. Lord, help me with this, that I will not let thee down, that I will not hurt other people through this sin and failing. Help me, Lord, to keep it in the front of my mind and warn my soul. That's what we have to do. Trust his help for sanctification. I remember many years ago, we had a gentleman here at the tabernacle came to speak for us in a meeting, and he was going to speak on the subject of anger, and he did. Four addresses to pastors and Christian workers gathered in this place on the subject of anger. And he hardly mentioned the Bible. And he hardly, he was an earnest Christian man, but he had so many remedies and approaches and so on to the issue of anger. Most of them seem to have been gleaned from uh, uh, psychological techniques, but not the Bible, not the scriptures, not recourse to prayer. That was just in passing, and it was so disappointing. And no, faith, precious faith, is in the power of God to help us with sanctification, bring it to him. And while I'm mentioning anger, there's nothing that responds so well to earnest prayer as the cure of anger. Have you become an angry man, an angry woman, a snappy person, a peevish person, and it's become a habit, and you've begun to wish you can get rid of it? Well, pray. That's the first thing. And if you pray, you'll be amazed how God will help you hold your tongue and bite back the words and calm your spirit. You won't want a 12-week course. God will help you. Put your faith in his power to help in sanctification and for every other sin also. So have faith in his power to help for service too. To teach Sunday school without first praying earnestly to the Lord for help on Saturday evening, on Sunday morning, silently before your class. Believe, put your faith in his power to help as you see children saved and eyes opened and the young blessed. Put your faith in his power to help you in your health whether he helps you to get better or whether he sustains you, that's the wisdom of God. But 
Faith, precious faith in the power of God's help. Faith in God's word. Invest faith constantly, every day. When you read it, say to yourself, I will put my faith in God's word to lift my spirit, lift my soul, to instruct me, to reprove me, to help me. And then you'll get blessing from the word of God. Put your faith in his promises. I'm often saying this, do you learn the promises of God? Do you collect them in the back of the Bible? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The great I wills, to collect them. There's a book, The I Wills of the Psalms. I'm not sure whether it's still in print <laughs> in the bookshop. 19th century book, it's wonderful. The I Wills of the Bible should be a great hobby of every Christian to collect the I Wills, the promises of God, which you'll have in your mind and in your heart for every situation and every need. But put your faith in the prescriptions of the Bible, the prescriptive passages which say how we should do things and what we should do. Christians all over, and we try to persuade them, have given up putting their faith in God's prescriptions. I don't really want to mention this, but in the USA we've read that there is a church there, a mega church, which is fragmented. And the pastor has gone under a cloud and the church has fallen into pieces and all kinds of things are going wrong. But the thing that one noticed is, however was this church governed? This is just a comment. It seems so curious. The elders seem to have powers they never should have had. The pastor seemed to have powers he never should have had. The whole organization of the church doesn't, didn't to me from bits I've read to seem anything like, anything like the pattern of the church in the Bible. And yet that pastor, aside from all his other woes, that pastor was a Bible thumper. But he didn't seem to put anything into practice about exactly how the affairs of the church should be conducted. This is just an example. And this is happening all over our country. You find uh, here and there all over the place an evangelical church that was following the Bible for decades and decades. Now has got a leadership team of this, complete transformation of its worship does everything differently, has brought in messy church, has abandoned formality and reverence, and everything's turned upside down, and all the prescriptions of the Bible have been abandoned. And yet the people of God are still saying, we're a Bible people, we're a Bible church. We've got to put our faith in God's prescriptions, not say, oh, it isn't working. It isn't working as we would like. There's a church over there, the other side of town seems to get a bigger crowd. We'll abandon the prescriptions, putting our faith in the prescriptions of the Bible, and we'll do it their way. That's a tragedy. So put your faith in the promises of God, in the prescriptions of the Bible. That's the way we have to go. Faith in his providence, faith in his help, Faith in his word, his promises and prescriptions. That's how we apply ongoing faith. Dear friends, see faith as a duty. It is my duty to exercise this precious faith that I've been given. See it as a privilege. See it as a debt. It's what I owe. I have been given so much. Christ has died for me. I owe him my faith. I must exercise my faith day by day. When you pray, exercise your faith. You exercise your faith in prayer by affirmation. Every day say, choose a doctrine. Several if you can. Lord, I thank thee for the perseverance of the saints that thy people will never be lost. Those who are truly saved will persevere to the end by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the kindness of God, will never be allowed 
to lose their way and to be finally lost. Praise God for his attributes. Affirm the faith. It strengthens and exercises your faith. Be thankful often. Tell God your love for him. Express your love to Christ for all he's done. Dedicate yourself. The act of dedication. Lord, I give myself to thee for this week. I yield up my life. I will put thee first. That's the exercise of faith. Rely upon him. Faith is radiant, you know. It's a radiant thing. I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 5 from the Sermon on the Mount and verses 11 and 12. Blessed are ye, says the Lord, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. That's faith. To be persecuted and to be injured and deprived, all kinds of hostility aimed at you, and your faith says, Christ my Lord said I must expect this and it will glorify him and he will be with me but I will rejoice that I am found worthy to suffer this persecution. The exercise of faith is a radiant thing and it witnesses and it testifies facts about faith. Let's consider, because we have the time, some facts about faith. Faith is infectious. Just like gossip is infectious. If there's gossips in the church, other people become gossips. People take up the turning over of possibly untrue things about other people. Gossip is infectious. Faith is infectious. You see, faith exercised by another Christian going through trials and tribulations and yet radiant and you want to be the same. It speaks to you and it challenges you. Faith is sympathetic. Why, if I really believe my faith, Christ has suffered and died for sinners and by trusting in him, I'm delivered from eternal condemnation and I am on the heavenly road and this, my Wife, husband, brother, sister, child is not. I am sympathetic. If I'm on autopilot in the faith, I no longer mind that I'm saved. I no longer value it as I ought. I'll be less sympathetic. But faith, because I believe. I believe in Christ and his goodness and what he's done and what it cost him and what has happened to me. Therefore, I must feel for others and be concerned about them. If your faith is active, you'll feel for lost people and for other people. Faith prays all the time. To pray in the morning and to pray in the evening and to never pray between, it shows there isn't much faith. Because if you really believe in the help of God and how much you need him, You'll be praying constantly through the day. I'm about to do something which I do not normally do, you'll say. I'm having to face some encounter or some responsibility. I will silently pray for help. I need now an emergency prayer. I believe God has been with me in something. I will thank him. I will thank him for a safe journey. I will thank him for an unexpected blessing and help. Faith prays all the time because faith sees Christ near with the eye of faith, believes him there, is never out of touch with God. Of course we have times when we're concentrating and we're very busy and we're distracted. Putting that aside, broadly speaking, faith will never be out of touch. So believe in short prayers, often as needed through the day. They also serve to keep you on the track, keep you from sin, because you're walking with God, you're in communion 
with him. Faith counts all interventions by God and values them and notes them. Faith always gives thanks. Faith acts. Why? You might say in the middle of the day, I've just had a thought that I ought to do something to help so-and-so, who I've heard is in great need. Faith acts. Faith believes that prompting may be of God. And I have to consider that. Faith acts on every pang of conscience. My Lord has activated my conscience. I must respond. I must act. Faith reflects. It doesn't waste time. When you're on your own, you can think about what God has done for you. And you can plan things for him. Faith reflects. Faith has been described as amens that never die. I've noticed that there's a trend, sometimes even in our church prayer meeting. Some friends, the amen becomes a desultory, almost half audible end to a prayer. Amen. You can scarcely hear it. It's not very good for the prayer meeting because it means all the people follow that. I suppose out of courtesy. The general amen is a muttered amen. And the prayer who prayed such an amen has forgotten that faith belongs in the amen too. The so be it at the end of the prayer has as much feeling in it as the prayer. And then all the people can, as an exercise of faith, endorse the prayer. Amen. And incidentally, in the word amen, this is, this is English grammar, not spiritual teaching, but the word amen in the English language, the emphasis is on the first syllable, amen. If you put it on the second syllable, amen. What you do, well, you cross the Atlantic for one thing, but what you do is you sound just like my old schoolmasters who used the word amen simply to indicate, well, that's over. Now we can get on with things that really matter. Amen. And immediately would say something. Amen. Now sit up straight. That kind of amen sends the shudder, takes me back over 60 years. <laughs> but amen is said with feeling, and there's faith in that great word, so be it. And everybody joins in the loud amen. Back to the scriptures. Oh, dear friends, the faith is amens that never fade. It's a reliance that never flags. Faith doesn't give way to self-confidence and self-reliance. I need the Lord. I am a foolish man or woman. I am a weak person. I stand with the help of my God. It's the world that says, love yourself, build up your self-esteem, have self-confidence, believe you can succeed. And the Christian says, oh, I do my best, but I need the Lord and I cannot succeed without him. It's altogether a different life plan. Faith is assurance. It is the same. I was reminding you only very recently that faith and assurance are opposite sides of the same coin. If you have faith, and it builds up as the Christian life goes on, or should do if it's exercised, I believe in my Saviour. I believe in my God. That is assurance. Works like this in illustrations. One side of the coin has the coat of arms on it. The coat of arms of the kingdom of God is the cross of Christ. It's an empty cross. Of course it is. It's not like a Catholic crucifix. It's got to be an empty cross because he's a risen Lord. It's the cross of Christ. That's my admission to heaven. He suffered and died to bear the punishment of my sin on my behalf. I believe in him with all my heart. I exercise my faith. 
I trust in him. And on the other side of the coin is the face of the sovereign. So that trust brings me to know his nearness and know his character and know his wonders and his power. And I get a flood of evidence of his presence in my life. So faith and assurance are one the same, just different aspects of the same thing in many ways. Faith is assurance. Yes, but the Apostle Paul says that out of faith and hope, by which he means anticipation, and love, out of faith, anticipation, and love, love is the greatest. Why are you making so much of faith? Yes, love is the greatest because it lasts the longest. When we die, faith becomes sight. We see everything is revealed. Faith falls away like a spent rocket on a spaceship. And now we have sight. We see all things. Yes, love is better in a way because, of course it is, it's a divine attribute. Faith isn't a divine attribute. God doesn't need faith. He sees all things and knows all things. So yes, love is greater than faith in many senses. Yes, love is the crowning grace. Love for Christ. But faith is the key to the door. Faith is the key to the kingdom. Faith is the appropriating grace that secures the blessing. Faith is the connecting grace that brings us into the presence of God because we believe him and we trust him. Oh, precious faith. Do you have it? The great gift of precious faith because you're a believer given to you, then value it, exercise it, employ it, use it. Even today, add to your list of people for whom you intercede one more name. Everybody, every Christian here did that. What blessing we would see, interceding faith. Use your faith. Every hour, every day, in every situation, as long as life shall last. Oh, I have a little time. Do you see faith in the miracles? The miracles of Christ, they were to authenticate him, to demonstrate he was divine, the son of God. They were pictures of what he does in the soul. And they were also pictures of the faith of the one who was blessed in so many cases. The man full of leprosy, he fell down and besought the Lord and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. If thou wilt. That's how faith speaks. He was profoundly convinced, not that he would be healed, that's where the charismatics get it wrong. But that if the Lord willed, he could do it. Our faith is in him. We pray for things. Well, it may not be the Lord's will for us to have this, to have that. However, if we pray for things, believing that he can do all that he chooses and that is divinely wise for his people, he can. That's where we put our faith in him. We see faith even in those who were healed and blessed in the ministry of Christ. The man taken with a palsy, paralyzed, who was let down through the roof of a house by his four friends because the crowd was so dense they couldn't get their patient to Christ. And when Christ saw their faith, not just the faith of the four, the faith of all five, when he saw their faith, 
He said, thy sins are forgiven thee. And later on, rise up and walk. Do you understand that? Faith goes to great lengths sometimes. When he saw their faith so evident in the lengths to which they would go. Well, God doesn't have to observe, but does he see your faith? Oh, but I prayed. Yes, but you only prayed once. That didn't demonstrate faith, praying once. Maybe if you prayed for six months and you were resolute and insistent and persevering, that would demonstrate your faith. You are certain that God can do this. And you plead with him for that person over a long period of time. When he saw their faith, in that case, demonstrated in the lengths to which they would go to get their patient under the eye of the Savior. The man whose right hand was withered, who was in the synagogue, stand forth, said the Lord. He did. Stretch forth thy hand. He did. He couldn't do anything else. He did what he could. He appealed. He applied. He stood up. He stretched his hand. That's faith. You stretch to the Lord. You pray with earnestness, with sincerity. You don't give up. You stretch out the hand to him. You have no other source of help and you trust him. That's faith, faith in the miracles. The blind men of Jericho, that's persistence too. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon us. Be quiet, they said, the crowd. Be quiet. They pushed them away and they carried on and they cried out all the more. That's persistence. Faith is demonstrated by persistence. So Christ restores the sight of one, another gospel, the other, and he says, thy faith hath saved thee. Persistence in trust and in prayer. The woman with an issue of blood for 12 years just touched the border, the hem of his garment, and then hid herself. She was a very humble soul. But Christ said, thy faith hath made thee whole. But she hadn't said anything. How could her faith be seen? Just a touch. She showed, trusted his power that just a touch would secure her help and blessing. She knew that just a touch he would be aware of her. He would read her heart and her need. Faith believes in the mercy of God, in his touchability, in Christ's readiness to respond. The disciples, well, we are going out of time now. The disciples, Master, we have toiled all the night and have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net and they enclosed a great shoal of fish. His word is the authority. At thy word, he's called us to pray. He's told us what to pray for, that we can pray for such and such. And in faith, we'll call upon him. Be justified by faith. If you've never come to Christ, come to him, repent of your sin, believe in him with all your heart, and through faith, you'll reach out to him and appropriate his saving power. Live by faith in his providence, in his help, in his word. Value the precious gift of your child of God. It's so precious and so effective in your life. Value it, express it every day, every week, every month, all the way to the end when God will turn it into sight. What a sight. Your faith will emerge into the full light 
of heavenly day. Let's close our thinking, singing together the hymn 544.